So the Gig by Johann Anton Logy from the Grade 3 syllabus for the Associated Board. Um, this piece is both on the old syllabus and the new syllabus that starts in 2009. The only difference is that if you're playing it from 2009, they'd like you to do the repeats. Um, first thing to think about a gig is really it's pretty lively. You don't want to go stupidly fast, obviously, but it's got to be lively enough to feel like a fairly energetic dance. And quite important to that in this piece is the dotted rhythm that you get in probably most of the bars, the dotted crotchet quaver rhythm. And that's just the kind of thing that an, an examiner will be able to pick up if you're getting the rhythm right, or if you're allowing the dotted note to uh, shrink and the quaver to come too soon, then they're going to pick that up as being um, a, a rhythm that you really could be getting better. Other particular feature to pick up right at the beginning is that the piece starts with an upbeat G on the third beat of the bar um, and all the phrases as you run through the piece they all start with an upbeat so for, for instance very often you have a chord shape and then you start with an upbeat and so from the technical point of view it's really quite important if you can keep in mind that the upbeat has got to join onto the chord that follows so you don't want a situation where you play the upbeat and then you're flapping around trying to find the chord because the upbeat, as I say, it's got to, it's got to go straight into the chord very legato. This is especially case, the case when you're going from bar uh, 12 into bar 13, which we'll come to in a minute. Other particular thing to concentrate on fairly hard is that the bass line is almost entirely in dotted minims, dotted half notes, and so the thing of keeping that finger on in the bass while the other fingers move around over the top, playing the upper line, again, pretty important. Um, again, the examiner will, will notice if you're keeping a kind of consistent legato quality to the bass line. And it's, it's just about the sort of thing to, uh, to make sure you're doing, to make sure you're getting all the marks you can. Now, most of the piece is actually quite straightforward. The one place that always jumps out at everybody is bar 13 and 14. So we're going to go over that in, in, in some detail. And so the first thing to realize is that you'll get from the beginning of the piece, you've been in the first position pretty well all the time. Um, end of bar 12, you've got your upbeat G, but you don't play it as a G and think, oh gosh, where am I? You get yourself into third position with your first finger on the D and your second finger going to the F sharp on the fourth string. And then you play the G and you go straight into the chord like that. It's very much three, one, like that. Okay? Now we're going to walk through the next bit nice and slow. You've played your chord on the downbeat of the bar and then your fourth finger takes the C on the third string. You could well keep the other fingers on Certainly your second, your second finger stays on the, on the F sharp. So you've done the chord, and then the fourth finger on the C, and then your third finger comes down just next door on the fifth fret of the fourth string, and then you play the open B. And it's actually quite important to think about your right hand here, because if you do your index finger on the G, your middle finger on the D, index finger C, and then middle finger open B, so you're doing I M, I M, like that. It'll help your hand just get on with the job, and then you'll be able to think more about your left hand. The last thing you want to be doing is doing bad crosses with your right hand when you're doing something um, that's it's a bit tricky with your left hand like that. And also just get into your mind that there's, there's a slightly strange feature that people quite often get a bit stuck on, which is that you're playing a C on the third string, and then a lower note on a higher string on the B, on the second string like that. And so if you, if you get into that habit of doing, doing that I am, I am uh, finger pattern, then it'll have its own momentum. You're more likely to kind of get through that strangeness of doing the C and then the open B like that. So again, you've got your open G, 
then your fourth finger C, third finger G with the open B. Then you're going to stretch your hand. You've been in third position for a moment and you've got to stretch back to second position but keep your fourth finger at the fifth fret on the D. Okay, so it's really, really important that it's not an open D, it's got to be a stopped D, like it says. So you do your D and your A, and you keep this finger planted on really firmly, open G, F sharp. So it's... And if you've been following with your right hand pattern, You've been going I, M, I, M, and then you've got an I on the A, and then M, I, is, gives you the good cross from the G to the F sharp there, okay? So we're going to walk through that from the G, the chord, fourth finger C, third finger G, stretch back to second, making sure the one and the four are stretching as they need to be. And then the A, keeping the fourth finger on, open G, and then the third finger to the F sharp. Of course it's an F sharp. Okay. Then the second finger, you can stay in second position for a moment, your second finger goes to the G, and then you've got your chord like that. It's a good idea with the um, bar 7 into 8, just before the repeat, just to allow the first chord to slightly staccato. Little, it helps throw a little bit of extra emphasis onto the long chord and then here you've got this, essentially the same thing there and right at the very end same thing all you're doing is letting your hand kind of come back just a little bit early and then playing the second uh, the last chord um, in time now what we're going to do is play it once through at a fairly gentle speed to get the feel and then I'll give it a, a kind of full speed run through at the end Count in after one, two. One, two. Keeping those bass notes nice and long, you do get to the other crotch of rest. Short chord, straight on. Keeping the dotted rhythm nice and crisp. and the general feel of the piece. Uh, this jig was written for Baroque guitar. Let's just you have a bit of a look to see if you can find um, an actual Baroque guitar performance on YouTube or somewhere else. Uh, the Baroque guitar as an instrument is smaller than your modern full-size instrument which dates really from the mid to late 19th century. It's a smaller body, fewer strings, often with uh, double courses and a single upper, upper course and very often with a very ornate carved rosette. They could be really, really kind of extraordinarily decorative instruments. But the sound is really quite light and airy. It's not a kind of heavy, ploddy sound at all. So you're looking to keep the sound really, the, the, the tone quite sort of light and free and open. Uh, probably if you use any rest stroke, it's only very occasional and, and really just to, to add a little bit of um, kind of confidence to the sound rather than making any kind of real strength to the tone. Dynamics, well this is a Baroque piece so in general you're looking at terrace to dynamics with slight crescendos. Um, it would be nice to do a bit of a crescendo when we do the tricky bars at around 13 or 14. Not everyone feels quite sort of sure enough of those places but that is actually where the piece is getting a little bit kind of worked up and exciting so it might be nice to do a bit of a crescendo there. <laughs> 